what's up? Did you just say why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> Whatever. Why not? Why not? Right. So yeah, our next speaker's name is Jake Archibald, and he works at Google Chrome's developer team, or developer relations team. And I don't know if you've noticed it, but before or each speaker comes on stage, entrance music plays. And we actually emailed them asking them, hey, what do you want your entrance music to be? And Jake never responded. Finally, he did kind of late. And we're like, hey, listen, like, if you don't pick something, we're just going to improvise. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's sure. Probably thinking that we had some sort of musical talent, <laughs> uh, which, uh, sure. Let's so. try this out. Jake, 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 Let's just leave it there. We can just leave it. Hello. <laughs> oh, yeah, that might be important. Thank you. Um, how do I transition from holding knives to giving a presentation about web performance? Um, OK, OK. That's excellent. Brilliant. OK. Um, safety first. OK. Hello. So, OK, um, every couple of months, this, this argument flares up uh, about progressive enhancement. And on one side, you get these dogmatic Luddites right, that think that JavaScript should be banned from the web. Uh, and on the other side, you get this group that think you need two megabytes of JavaScript just to, just to render a paragraph. Or at least that's how the debate gets represented in, in 140 characters you know, on Twitter, the home of reasonable debate. But, but who's correct? I mean, personally, I think there, there is a benefit to uh, making stuff work without JavaScript, especially if you need to support all the browsers, things like um, Internet Explorer 8 and below and, and the old Android WebKit browser. In those cases, you can make the core proposition of your site work without JavaScript and then just don't give JavaScript to those uh, particular browsers. It's really simple to do this, really simple to implement. Like Before any of your JavaScript runs, perform a, a feature test. Now, you should test the features that you use throughout your code. Um, but at the outset, I think it's kind of OK to, to cheat a little uh, like this and sort of sniff out a, a modern-looking browser. Here I'm using the Page Visibility API, which I reverse engineered from the Can I Use data set, because it's the one feature uh, that doesn't work, or it, it will fail a feature test in IE9 and below, and it will also fail a feature test in the old WebKit Android browser. Even though these um, squares are green, they need a WebKit prefix, so you just don't test for the, the prefix. And you just don't serve JavaScript to those browsers. And, and that means they're running off plain old HTML and, and CSS. You're protecting yourself from the real bitey parts of those browsers. It becomes a lot safer. The, the content still works, so it's fine. Developing becomes way easier. Testing becomes way easier. And for newer browsers, well, you can start having fun with modern JavaScript features, modern DOM features. But if you don't need to support older uh, browsers, then this approach, I think, can feel a little bit unnecessary, uh, kind of like a, a quirks mode approach to, to progressive enhancement. Because if you can rely on the JavaScript engines of the browsers you need to support, then I, I think it's OK. I think you can depend on JavaScript. There's no reason for your stuff to work without it. I don't know this is pretty groundbreaking for me to come to a JavaScript conference and say, I think JavaScript's OK. I think you should use it. But, but some progressive enhancement thinkers do disagree with me on this one. Uh, but if you spend more time catering for users that have JavaScript deliberately turned off than users who have to use assistive technologies such as screen readers, then I think your priorities are, are all wrong. I, and I bring accessibility up deliberately because uh, I mean, we heard this, uh, Alice talking about this yesterday. There's a kind of fallacy that dependency on JavaScript means uh, an inaccessible site. But you can actually use JavaScript to improve uh, the user experience for assistive technology users. Uh, yeah, we saw that yesterday with the expanding and collapsing menu. Progressive enhancement is about building up from a baseline, but each project will have its own baselines in a variety of, of categories. Um, 
both uh, Alice and Paul earlier like, quoted Ed Souden. It's not about browsers, it's about users. Uh, and it's user capability in terms of like, cognitive, sensory, and motor skills, but also about the user's device in terms of its form factor, its input capabilities, and its connectivity. We set and adjust baselines based on our actual real users. And yeah, 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 we should be as inclusive as possible. Um, but depending on JavaScript doesn't necessarily mean that you exclude users. Of course, don't use JavaScript to re-implement things the browser already does, like checkboxes and scrolling. Definitely not scrolling. Uh, but build on top of what's already there and use JavaScript to create great user experiences. So things like Talkie.io, this is a WebRTC video chat app. You can't do that without JavaScript. This is SVG OMG, it's a SVG minifier. Does its work entirely on the client. Of course, you could just have a form that accepts a file inputs. You give it an SVG, it goes off to the server and returns the result. And then add in the client side stuff with a, as an enhancement. But who actually benefits from that? With progressive enhancement, every phase of the enhancement absolutely must have uh, a real user that benefits from it. And in a world where everyone has like, modern browsers, is progressive enhancement dead? So at the start of the year, um, I bought myself a PS4. Uh, and a particular feature of the PS4 caught my eye. When downloading a game, you could play level one, even though level 30 was still downloading. Well. Whoopee shit. Because <laughs> the web has had this feature for 20 years. This is the full HTML spec loading here. It's a 30 megabyte document. It's still downloading, but after only 20k has been received, it gets on the screen. It's continuing to load, still downloading, but it feels really snappy. This is what makes the web feel fast. Browsers embrace data streaming uh, like this. You don't need a lengthy install step just to, to get something on the screen. Whereas for things like consoles, the, the PS4, the web was a kind of awkward add-on. They didn't really know what to do with it at first. It was mostly used for, uh, for online gaming. And I don't know about you, but I have zero interest in online gaming because I've never played a game that I thought would be better with the addition of verbal abuse from a child. <laughs> I... But no, seriously, any game with one of these like, headset things, it's like being on the phone to the Westboro Baptist Children's Choir, you know? It's just <laughs> a torrent of abuse. But what do we do with this amazing web feature? We web engineer it away. And when I point to poor performance and the actual real impact it has on things like retention, sales, donations, downloads, the counter-argument is often well, actually, I think you'll find this is an app, not a site. There is no good definition for the difference between a web app and a website, and all too often it's used just as an excuse for poor performance or poor user experience. Users do not stare at a blank loading screen and think, well, thank Christ this is a web app and not a website, <laughs> otherwise I'd be having a bad experience with this. And on that note, I want to, I want to go back and look at Talkie.io, because uh, the, the, the author of Talkie.io is a, is a big framework fan. This is built with a big framework. <laughs> this wasn't a very remote call, it turned out. <laughs> but Yeah, so the author of this, big framework fan, um, and he gave this anti-progressive enhancement talk uh, in Brighton last year, and it was really well written, and he was really smart and eloquent, and I really, really hate him so much. So I'm going to pick on his site as a kind of petty form of revenge. Uh, actually, I did I, I talk to him about it. I said I was going to use an example. He was fine with that. Um, and in, in fact, he's actually changed his point of view on a lot of this stuff, and, and that's going to... You'll see that in the next version of Talkie, things are going to be quite different. But this is, I'm going to talk about how things currently stand. We're going to have a look and see how long it takes to render on a 3G connection. And I always use 3G as my test, because uh, although we have 4G now, I mean, some of your users are going to be operating with a fiber connection directly in the back of their head, but a lot of people are going to be on mobile. And even 4G users are going to be on 3G or worse, like... Uh, a quarter of the time uh, here in Sweden, it's like half the time in the UK, it's you know, different in different places. So how long does it take them to get to first render? It takes... Eight seconds. 
But let's put this into perspective. Like, this isn't the worst. While the PS4 may have embraced progressiveness, uh, the web store certainly hasn't. Like, almost 16 seconds to get to a, a decent content render. Uh, and we know this is bad, right? Because this is a site, this is like a store, like Amazon is a store, and we know like 16 seconds would be absolutely ridiculous, but Talkie is an app, right? So is eight seconds suddenly okay now? When we talk about load times, we must consider what we actually got in, uh, in the time we waited. Um, and we didn't get a slick, featureful video chat app. We got this. The video chat stuff is hidden away somewhere. It's, it's at least a click away. Adobe spent a lot of time optimizing the startup time of Photoshop um, because a few years ago, it was absolutely ridiculous to be staring at this for 30 seconds to get this. Because what can I actually do with this? There are a load of buttons that don't do anything, a load of menu items that are disabled. All I can do here is open a new image, uh, well, open an existing image, or create a, a new one, and that's absolutely all I can do, and that does not take 30 seconds of loading to achieve. Eight seconds. It's kind of alarming that this decade's web apps are willfully making the mistakes of last decade's native apps. We need to let people play level one as soon as level one is, is downloaded. Um, when downloading and displaying content, don't wait until you've buffered everything before you show anything. So, so how would we do this for, for Talkie.io? Um, like most framework-driven sites, Talkie has no content in the markup. Don't do that. Like, markup is great for content. It's absolutely brilliant for it. So add some. Add all the markup needed to make that look like that. Like, we've been doing that without JavaScript for a, a long time. If you absolutely cannot get content in your markup for whatever reason, at least use it for the rest of your UI, the kind of shell of, of the page. But hear this. A splash screen is not an acceptable first render. It is an admission of failure. It is a gravestone commemorating the death of your performance. <laughs> and don't put the names of those responsible on it. That's embarrassing. So the same goes for spinners and loading bars. These are, these are failure cases. In fact, here's, you know, because I'm picking on other people's sites, here's one a little bit closer to home. This is Gmail. Um, Gmail has a loading bar, and this is such a problem that they have a whole different implementation of all of Gmail, the basic HTML version uh, that they offer you in this situation. And that's something separate that they have to maintain. But what did I get? What do I get after this loading bar finishes? Do I get an HD movie? Do I get an immersive WebGL experience of Swedish culture? No. I get a list with some words in it. I, I shouldn't wait 30 seconds for that. It does not need a loading bar. So we've got some markup on there. What do, what do we need now? As, as Steve Souder says, like, go async with everything. Uh, don't block the rendering of that marked up content. So for scripts, yeah, uh, Paul mentioned it earlier, the async attribute does a, a pretty good job. But we're also going to load the uh, font CSS async there as well, and we're going to use this load CSS. It's a little script by the, uh, the filament group, because uh, there isn't just an async attribute on the link element, unfortunately. Hopefully, we'll get one soon. Um, I would actually avoid using web fonts for any first render content. Uh, I know that's a big argument to have with branding people, but um, th there is a CSS property kind of being proposed, which I'm really interested in, and it lets you say something like, if the web font is cached and it's going to just appear straight away, use it, otherwise use one of the fallbacks, but download the web font for the next render. And I'm really looking forward to that, because I think that solves a lot of the performance problems. But until that, web fonts are a bit of a problem. So. If Talkie did all that, you know, they put content in their markup, made the script async, and loaded the font async, their render time would go from eight seconds to <laughs> That's a huge difference. That's 6.4 seconds saved on 3G for those tiny little changes. On a five megabit connection, that's going from 2.5 seconds down to half a second. That's, that's huge as well. If something about the framework you use prevents you from doing this, you know, the, the basics. Seriously, drop it and get a better one, because it's out of date. It was 
born out of date. It's locking you into these mistakes of last decade's native apps. Nothing should have a JavaScript dependent first render. It just, it just doesn't need it. It only punishes the user. However, this does present a small problem because we've rendered, and one of the things we've rendered is this let's go button up at the top, but our JavaScript is loading async, so it might not be there by the time the user presses this. So you could like hide it until the script loads. You could, you could put a spinner there, I suppose. Or lie to the user. Like, pretend you're ready, because you'll probably get away with it. Like, and you don't have to leave it to chance, right? Have a little bit of JavaScript in your page. Like, have a variable there that the main JavaScript will set to true when it arrives. Um, get hold of that form. And you know, when that's submitted, if your main JavaScript's loaded, that's fine. Just return. Otherwise, make a note of the, the room name that they entered. And then when the main JavaScript loads, it can take that and go, oh, OK, someone actually tried to interact. I'm just going to start up this video call. But once you've done that, I, I really hate spinners. So I would acknowledge the user's click using the, the activate stuff that, um, you know, uh, actually, is it activate or response? What's the A in rail? Where are you? Response, thank you. OK. Uh, so when you know, the response part of Rail happens, uh, make sure you, you acknowledge that, activate the button, change its color, whatever. But don't show a spinner unless another second goes by. And then you have to really admit to, I've, I've failed to react in a reasonable amount of time. I have to kind of admit to the lie uh, that I was ready. So. But you know, if your JavaScript's small enough, they're not going to hit that. With SVG OMG, I'm actually really lazy. If you interact with any of the page before the JavaScript loads, it just does this. Like, <laughs> may as well be this, really. It's a terrible excuse. <laughs> I mean, I could do something better, but the JavaScript needed to avoid this happening is only 15k. Um, so I'm kind of betting no one will see it. But I, well, I'm not betting. I'm using analytics to check, and it's happened four times. Two of them were me checking the analytics were working. Another one was an old version of IE, and I don't care. Uh, the other one looked genuine, actually. Uh, but that's like one out of thousands and thousands. And it's, yes, this is a bad experience. But if no users ever experience it, is it a bad user experience? I, I think not. That's the excuse I'm going to use anyway. Um, yeah, so using all of the stuff that I've talked about so far, I was seeing SVG OMG rendering around about 2.6 seconds. Um, and like Paul was talking about, like, there's a lot of connection overhead on 3G, which was sort of most of it. But I did um, put more effort into it and got it down to around about 1.7 seconds. Uh, and, and this is how I did that. So you know, it was just for the first render, 1.7 seconds. If we take a look at the, the waterfall for that, yeah, the, the majority of that time is all connection set up. That's the thinner part of this bar. Oh, well, no, it's a, there's a tiny little blue line right at the end there. And that's the stuff that I can actually control. Um, once that's downloaded, you get the first render. And it's, it's only 5K, 5K of content for the first render. And that shouldn't be a shock, because it's that, right? Just look at it. There's not a lot to it. 5K is fine. And then the, uh, some extra JavaScript comes down the wire and some extra CSS. Uh, that takes about three quarters of a second. That's 4K of additional CSS, 15K of JavaScript. And once that lands, the, it's fully interactive. You know, the user can uh, play level one. They can select an image to optimize, which is really all they can do at this point. One second later, like free workers arrive uh, that handle SVG minifying, uh, syntax highlighting, and, and gzipping. But the user doesn't care that these were loading in the background. And sure, right? I'm using JavaScript to load some of a JavaScript, which is slower than just loading it all in, in one lump. But one lump would increase that first time to render, increase that first time to interaction. And those are the things that are important. When I was a kid at school, they had someone come in to tell us about the, the dangers of, of, of smoking. Um, and you know, like a good little child I, I, child, I took it all in. Uh, and I went home, and I related it all to my dad, uh, who is a smoker. And I was like, Dad, did you know that cigarettes contain all of these hundreds of cancers, and you're damaging society, and it's horrible chemicals? And then I finished on the big fact that I'd learned uh, in that day. And I said, did you know, Dad, every time you smoke a cigarette, you reduce your life by 10 minutes? And my dad thought for a moment, and he said, can it be this 10 minutes? <laughs> well. And despite being a total smart ass, he, he had a point, right? That the, the time people hate wasting the most 
is right now. Like adding a few hundred milliseconds to the, 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 um, the full experience of this um, is fine if it decreases the time to first render and first interaction. The user doesn't notice the extra. They're distracted by having a thing that they can use. So things are looking great on 3G, um, but we all have phones, right? We, we know that we don't always have even 3G. We quite often have this, which I call Li-Fi. I, I think we've all experienced this, and I'm determined to make this like a kind of industry term. I want this to be my Ajax, you know? But, I, you, you know, you've had this, like when the phone thinks it has connectivity, sometimes it's actually full bars, and it's like, yeah, I can, I can handle loading some stuff, and you're like, okay, go on then, and it's just like, <laughs> are, you, are you getting anywhere? And it, it's sometimes really bad that you kind of, you think I'm gonna give up on this and get on with the rest of my life, just staring at this white screen, and then you think, right, okay, sometimes I actually give myself, I give it five seconds, like, like that might help. Uh, I give it a countdown, right, you've got to do it in five seconds. Five, four, three, two. And then just as I get to one, the progress bar will go <laughs> by like three pixels. And all of a sudden, I'm now locked into another two minutes of staring at this white screen. It's, ah, oh, it's infuriating. It's the worst thing. It's worse than offline. I mean, at least offline gives you a quick answer and lets you get on with the rest of your life, not like, Fucking Li-Fi, like this just long stare at the white screen, the infinite spinner, it's, oh, it's absolutely infuriating. We need to fix this. Um, progressive enhancement just needs to evolve here. Like the majority of users now have a, an auto-updating modern browser, uh, and enhancing based on browser capabilities is a lot easier than, than it used to be. But varying network conditions have always been a bigger problem. We just couldn't really do much about it. Um, and as mobile inc usage increases around the world, especially with like, emerging markets where connectivity is like, not so great, it's an even bigger issue. Offline first is progressive enhancement with the network. Yeah, and we can do this now. Uh, Service Worker landed in Chrome Stable in January, uh, and it's coming to Firefox in like a, a couple of months or so. If you want one, all you do is you call this on your page, and that gives you a script that will sit in between uh, your page and, and the network, and, and there it is. Uh, you also get a programmable cache to add or remove entries from, as, as you so desire. Um, and inside that JavaScript, you'll, you'll receive events, like install when the browser sees the service worker for the first time, activate um, when it's ready to control pages, but most importantly, fetch. Uh, and that's when one of your pages is fetched from the network, or one of those pages makes a, a network request to anywhere. And like other browser events, you can prevent the default and do kind of whatever you want, really. You can do your own thing. In the case of SVG or MG, I use the install event to go to the network and, and get everything I need to sort of get to first render the HTML page, the CSS, the JavaScript, and I store them in the cache for use later on. And then next time a page loads, that it's controlled by the service worker, it catches the network event and just plucks the response straight out of the cache and sends it on. It doesn't go to the network at all. The service worker doesn't do any of this for me. Um, as a developer, I've decided this should happen for this request uh, using JavaScript, because that's the user experience I think uh, is best in this particular situation. But even, even though I'm kind of being explicit about everything, it's not so much code. Like This is the install code for listing all of the resources. Uh, and this is the uh, fetch event to dictate like, what it should do with network requests. I'm not deep diving into the API. Um, I'm just showing that it's not a, not a whole lot of code. But you're in complete fu full control. And doing this takes the uh, performance of SVG OMG's repeat visits down from like one to two seconds for first render to tenth of a second. That was faster than yours, Paul, isn't it? Wasn't it a tenth of a second? <laughs> but the important thing is this is how fast it is on 3G. This is how fast it is offline. This is how fast it is on Li-Fi. The network no longer has any impact on the performance. Of course, the browser will check in the background for updates to your uh, service worker, because you know we all add features, fix bugs, uh, etc. And if, if anything has changed, if it's byte different, for instance, we change that to v2 or whatever, because we've updated some CSS or JavaScript. Uh, the browser sees that, and it starts up a new version. And that will sit there, and it will have its own install event, and it will go to the network, get everything it needs, put those in a, in a cache. But it won't take over while the old version is still in use. But once pages using the old version uh, get closed, you know, there's nothing left to, um, to control. So the old version isn't 
needed anymore. It becomes well, redundant and it goes away. But then it can move in, the new version, and take over and start loading pages, and everything's great. And this is, this is playing it safe, really. Um, sometimes you want to take over quicker than that, which you can do as well. Uh, you can call skip waiting, it's just that one-liner, whenever you want. And that says, like, actually, I want to take over now, kick the old version out, I'm just, just going to take control. But you need to be aware that when you do that, you're now controlling pages that um, were loaded with some older versions, HTML and JavaScript, etc. In terms of user experience, you can actually sort of monitor this from a page. So, uh, like, if the, because uh, you get events when, when these controllers change. So if the user, uh, come on, Jake. Gah, brain into gear, here we go. So, if the user doesn't interact with the page by the time you find out about an update, you could just refresh the page. Like this, that's going to happen. It happened. The user doesn't notice. I mean, you could tell them about it, which is you know, pretty good. But uh, you don't have to. It could just have happened, and they wouldn't have noticed. However, sometimes updates take a little bit longer than that. So that's going to happen here. Updates happening in the background. It finally lands at some point. And we can tell the user, right, there's an, there's an update available. You can click here to, to reload. We absolutely must protect users from these conditions in, in the network, but sometimes when I suggest this, I get this response. Users don't stare at a white screen and think, well, thank God this is a website, otherwise I'd be having a bad time right now. Even in sites, we should be operating offline first. Take Wikipedia, for example, the, the sightiest site there is. This is something I, I prototyped recently. Um, you might have seen me go on about it, like wiki offline. This is just a web app. I've added it to the home screen, but it's, it's just built with the web. Um, excuse the poor design. I, I literally have no idea what I'm doing. But if we search for Mad Max, we can get to the article. It loads. But you can see in the top corner here, we have this read offline button. So you know, we can press that. And now I can like, close all of the tabs. I can get rid of them. I can, and sometime in the future, when I have uh, no network connectivity, I can go back into the app, and it's there in my cached articles, and I can load it. And it all loads instantly, because it's just coming from a cache. Paul's laughing at me every time I drink this stuff, because I really fucking hate fizzy water. But it's warm under the lights, and I need it more than I hate fizzy water. <laughs> um, so yeah, sites even benefit from this stuff. But what if uh, I wanted to read another article? I wanted to read about uh, Shelley's From. Is that how you pronounce the name? Sure, sure. No. Yeah, anyway, the good one in it. Um, so I click that link, and we're here. We're, we're back in this situation. We're in Li-Fi hell. Because you know, we can't cache all of Wikipedia. That's, that's not possible. Uh, but we're working on a feature that lets you do something better. So here we are again. But this is in the latest dev version of Chrome. Click the link, get a spinner. But then we tell the user, hey, that's taking a while. Do you want us to do something about that? And we say, oh, yeah, it's failed or whatever. So when the user clicks this load in the background, we say, oh, yeah, do you want to get a notification about this? And this is a good time to ask for permission, because it's really, it's really contextual. So we go, the user goes, yeah, I'd like to know about that. And now the user can like, close the browser, lock the phone, and get on with their life. They don't have to be staring at this white screen forever. And then sometime in the future, they get a notification. And they can click it. And they get the article instantly, like, even with the images and everything. And even though they've got no connection now, it all just loaded. And implementing this didn't require any clever server stuff. Like, this was built using low-level technologies that were building into Service Worker. Background sync. This is what we're working on. This lets you do a small bit of work in the service worker, either now, if the user has connectivity, or sometime in the future, when, once they get connectivity. This feature will become the way to, get, uh, to send important data to the, the server, things like emails and chat messages, things that really must reach the server, even if the user like, closes the tab or they don't have connectivity now, you want it to, to send sometime later. But it can also be used for downloading small bits of content, like we saw there. So 
this is a couple of months away from hitting stable. We need to work out some of the, the privacy issues around it. And you know, we need to build a full spec and, and we need to talk a bit more to, I think, Mozilla, because they're, they're kind of interested in this. Um, but they, I mean, there's a privacy issue around this as well, because it's one of the first times we're letting sites run kind of code like this in, in the background. Native apps get to run uh, background code all the time, right? But we hold the web to a higher standard when it comes to security. Uh, but yes, yeah, so we need to we need to have a think about that as well. So Service Worker gets you these kind of exciting new features. It gets you on screen in like a tenth of a second. You can do this today in Chrome, which depending on what you're building, I mean, that, that could be a large portion, even a majority of your users. Um, in a couple of months, Firefox support lands as well. Internet Explorer have said they are going to implement this. They just haven't given it a, a, a date yet. So, you know, we, we don't know when. Safari, on the other hand, we don't really know. They, they work in secret. Um, although yesterday, I received this tweet from uh, Benjamin Poulain, and he works on, for Apple on Firefox. And I don't know if you read this the same way as me, but this seems to be a strong suggestion that some bugs don't get fixed. Like, on your phones, there are things your phones do badly or break that they, don't, they deliberately do not fix because they don't like me very much. I, I, am I reading that wrong? I don't know. I mean, I, I, asked, for them, I asked them to tell me which bugs uh, they're holding back on, but they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't say. Um, so at the after party, if your iPhone does something wrong, um, come and find me and tell me I'm a dick, and I will tell you I'm sorry, because I think it's my responsibility now. But... Um, don't let, don't let this stop you. Don't let this sort of stuff stop you. Because you can use Service Worker today uh, and not damage things in other browsers. I don't know if you've heard of the technique. It's progressive enhancement. We built Service Worker from the ground up to be prog entirely progressive enhancement friendly. Even on browsers that support Service Worker, it's, it's not going to be there the first time you load a page. It's all done in the background. It doesn't disrupt the user. It becomes enhancement for future requests. If you want Safari to support this, then use it. And make your stuff faster in Chrome and Firefox uh, than they are in, in Safari, because then Apple will, well, if they get over their personal issues with me, they will have to implement it to, to, to make things uh, faster. Also, I mean, stuff working offline is, is, is good, but it's not the, the main reason to do this. I think performance is the main reason. Because uh, it's going to take a while for users to, to get used to the idea of a, a web that works offline. So I don't know if you have the, these in Sweden, but on, on the trains I, I commute in, they have these toilets, right? These big cylindrical-shaped toilets with a big revolving automatic door. Do you guys have, have that here? No, it's more sensible country. Fair enough. So it's a big automatic door, and when you, and when you get inside, you're greeted with this. And you have to click the, this, this button, I think, to close the door, and then this one flashes, and you Click that, I think. Yeah, the instructions are there, and it's really good, because they've got it in Braille as well, so even blind people know they have to wait for the flashing light <laughs> to, to press. But I don't trust this system. <laughs> and I don't trust it because it has failed on me. And I was sat on the toilet, and the door slowly opened and revealed me like a bad game show prize to the rest of the carriage. It was probably my fault. I probably didn't hit the, the, the buttons correctly. I didn't do it in the right order. I didn't sing the right song as I did it. I don't know. But I, I prefer doors that I can lock and then check that they are locked with my human hand, you know, testing it. Similarly, users don't trust offline on the web because they've seen it fail. And even when you tell them, yeah, this, this works, there's no easy test they can do to, to check that it works. I mean, there's airplane mode, but you know, that's, that's, that's a painful experience to go through that just to check. But I think that the performance boost is, is worth it alone. And features like background sync, they'll delight the user and, and start to show the user that you know, web, the web can be more network resilient than even native can. Also, Chrome now promotes uh, add to home screen. If a user visits a, a site a few times and it has a service worker and it has the web manifest, you'll get a little uh, thing saying, hey, you, you go to this site quite a lot. Do you want to add it to your home screen? 
And now it looks and feels like a native app. And then the expectations change, and users will think, oh yeah, maybe this should work offline the same way the other apps I have uh, do. But you, know, you get the benefits of the web with this system. You know, updates are lighter, web apps, uh, the, it's more secure, you know, the, the privacy stuff's a lot better, and they're shareable across devices and operating systems. So I guess that's my, that's my challenge to all of you. Like, render without JavaScript, like, add in level one behaviors early, and for future visits, render without the network, make it the same experience no matter what connection the user has, save users from Li-Fi. This is how we beat native apps at user experience. Thank you very much.